So, it's a nice audience uh, today. It's not always uh, usual that we come to a full, fully booked uh, hall. People are standing at the back. Uh, my name is Taufiq. It's very hard to pronounce in uh, English, in Dutch. So I use the first letter of my name, T in English, T in Dutch. And if you have any questions later, you can just address them in Dutch. I fully understand. Can I talk Netherlands? But it's easier for me to talk about blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and what we do at Taiken in my comfort zone, the English language. Before we start, I want to ask you, the audience, do you believe in superpowers? Do you believe that superpowers do exist? Just raise your hand if you do believe. So one of the things that I discovered when I came to Holland in 2012 is that I am an invisible man. <laughs> I know that you can see me and you can hear me, but actually this is what's written on my driving license. So the Dutch government legally said that I am invisible. I am born in unknown. And the reason it's written unknown on my driving license is I was born in Kuwait in 1990. There was the Gulf War where Saddam Hussein, he invaded Kuwait. And the result was the birth registries, the civil registries in Kuwait, they were destroyed. It's a war tactic. The Kuwaiti government actually, they burned their own registries so that the people cannot be identified. The registries are central. And from that moment, 1990, until today, nothing has changed around the world in how we deal with birth certifications. So even in the Netherlands, every single one of you has a copy of his birth certificate. You do not own your birth certificate. It's the Dutch government that own the moment of your birth and they keep that piece of paper in the vaults of the Ministry of Justice. It's a safe place. <laughs> yeah, thank you for agreeing with me on that. <laughs> but today, it's not only about me. Today, it's about 611 million people who are vulnerable around the world. Two-thirds of the African continent have a problem in their identity systems and their identity management. In Africa alone, 50% of the babies born, they are unregistered. We used to pitch before that the number of invisible children around the world is 230 million, but this number changed. Today, it's 290 million. So, world organizations, instead of working to decrease that number, actually it is going the other way around. I lost my documents in a man-made disaster, in war. But what we are noticing today is people are losing their identities, their ownerships, their land titles, because of natural disasters, which are somehow man-made, but that's a debate for later. Natural disasters, they do not discriminate. So Florida and San Martin, they have the same effect. People losing houses, people losing their IDs. So if we want to summarize the problem today, is that identity systems, they're paper-based, they lack interoperability because they're paper-based, and even when governments want to do digitization, they do it in the wrong way. So my birth certificate cannot communicate with my driving license, cannot communicate with my passport, and cannot communicate with any type of other document. And what pushed me to start up Taiken is the last reason. Today, identities are not resilient. They're not resilient to fraud, and they're not resilient to permanent loss. 
So this is where we started. This was my room E18 in my last stop as an asyl seeker. I moved between five different camps. I told you I was born in Kuwait, but I'm not Kuwaiti, or else I wouldn't be here. I'd be driving my Lambo around this campus. <laughs> my father is Syrian, so I carried the Syrian nationality. In 2014, when my work contract was not renewed, I had to apply for asylum in order to stay. Because in that year, it was the climax of the war in Syria, and actually not any country until today accepts people of Syrian roots or Syrian passports, except they come illegally and they come irregularly. So, when I started in my asylum procedure, I started in Terapel. I moved to Zvole. I went back to Terapel. I moved to Khilzerain. I went back to Terapel. And then I moved to Zeist at the end. And in every step of the process, I had to re-register again in the camp. So this is a waste of time. This is a waste of money. This is a waste of the European Union funds that are given to the governments to help refugees. And this is also the waste of the taxpayers' money. So this is why we wanted to do something different. And it is that in that same room where I noticed that it's not only me I don't have a birth certificate now. We have almost 150,000 refugees in the Netherlands where I can tell you around 30% will have the same pitch as I started. I was happy to have the most famous driving license in the Netherlands, but now many thousands of people in the Netherlands will have unknown on their driving licenses. That problem we cannot solve anymore because the issuer of that document does not exist. But we can prevent that from happening in the future. My neighbor in the second bed, he was a doctor. He can do heart surgeries blindfolded. What do you think he's doing now? Nice yeah, I wish. He's filling chocomilk bottles in Albertine. Because this guy cannot prove he is a doctor. And we cannot expect to tell him, go train on a few people in the emergency room <laughs> to check whether you can really do heart surgeries, yes or no. The authority that issued his university diploma doesn't exist in Aleppo anymore. Aleppo today is a flat land like Netherlands. But there's no greenery and there's no fits uh, line. There is rubble everywhere. So this is where, as Bas was saying before me, when we want to check the authenticity or the existence of an event or an asset or a paper, blockchain can come to help. So I talked about my refugee journey, and it is part the reason I wanted to put it in post notes today is to show you that when you work in any startup or when you do in any blockchain project, especially in the blockchain and crypto world, do your journeys, verify your assumptions, because at the end you might find out that blockchain doesn't fit in your solution. So before we move forward, Bus gave a really nice presentation about blockchain and cryptos, but we lack the standardization today. We lack the definition, the consensus on what is a blockchain. I used the blockchain in the camp, and I used it because I had this, I had my smartphone. I was able to connect to the financial world using this technology. So we designed one world. We have one of the best brilliant UX designers in our team. He's actually my co-founder. And together, we came up with the iBond. And iBond represents immutability. Anything that you write on this technology cannot be deleted. 
And now we have a clash with the GDPR law. Because hashes are considered personal identifiers. And how can we delete them from this technology? B stands for borderless. Remember where I was in a refugee camp. So this area is secluded from the Dutch territory and from any geography in the world. But still, using bitcoins, I was able to be connected financially to the world. In the asylum camp, before you are granted the status to stay in the Netherlands, they do not give you any financial support. So in order for me to make some money, I was selling consultancy via Skype. I was working on a platform called Wikistrat, where we give consultancy to different agencies around the world on the advantages of, and disadvantages of using crypto. And they were paying me in bitcoins. This was early days of 2014. The technology is open and it's neutral. When you use it, nobody will ask you for your first name, for your last name, for your date of birth, for your address, postcode, skin color. You can be included. And the most important thing, and why this will not fail, and why this will disrupt everything that we know, and nobody in this room, not even I, not anyone can think what is the future going to be like with blockchain. Decentralization. You cannot attack this network. You cannot take it down. Bitcoins existed in the Netherlands in 1990. It had a different name. Digicash. David Kwam, if you Google kvk.nl or kvk.com and put Digicash, you will see a business existed in the Netherlands in the 90s where they're doing digital currencies. His problem was, at that time, there was not enough acceptance on the concept of digital money. Credit cards were popping up, and they were the hype of that area. But what are the ingredients here? How can we make this? I always say it's a salad. It's a Greek salad. You have lettuce, tomato, cucumber, olive oil, feta cheese, if you like. And you mix them. When you mix the ingredients of cryptography, distributed systems, consensus algorithms, economics, probability, statistics, you will get Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is the blockchain. Bitcoin with the capital B is a protocol. Bitcoin with a capital B is a technology. And Bitcoin with a small letter B is the currency of this network. So when we read articles or when we read reports and we see Bitcoin written with a half letter in the middle of the article, that's not a typing mistake. The author is referring to this technology or this network. So, Going back now to the asylum camp, I was moving between different asset says. And what I noticed is, in every camp, I was again giving my identity and again giving who I am. So we can use the blockchain to build the network, but how are we going to innovate in the identity space? What principles must we use in order to build an identity that is compatible with this technology. So, 2016, the concept of self-sovereign identities started to pop up. The first reference to self-sovereign identities came in 2012. And these are the 10 principles. In my personal opinion, we cannot adhere to these 10 principles today. 
because every use case, every scenario has its requirements. So in the refugee journey, what is important is existence, that I can prove I exist. When Ahmed, he lands in Lesbos from his boat, and he goes to the nearest asylum camp, he can say who he is. He has his smartphone, because they navigated the way using their smartphones to land in Greece or to land in Europe. The moment there is interaction with anyone, with the volunteers or with the camp operators, he can prove he exists using a simple cryptographic signature. At the same time, Ahmed cares about his privacy. And it was a misconception from me as a refugee to say that refugees don't care about their privacy. Where well, I was wrong, because they do care and maybe more than you do care in this room. Because they don't want their stories to go back to the regime. They don't want their families to be in danger when they protest in the Amsterdam arena or in Den Haag and they hold the new Syrian flag or the reference of whoever group they belong to. So their privacy is important. And the administrators of the refugee camps in the Netherlands, they have access to all their data, their stories, their families, where they live, who is behind in Syria, who is here. So privacy is important. And privacy is not important to protect their identity, but to comply with the current law now. So back in the 90s, they were thinking of privacy on the internet. After 20 years, they applied the law. And this law says, you must encrypt your data. You must not share your data without the consent of the user. So we take existence, portability, interoperability, and consent when we want to build identities for refugees. And interoperability is very important because we will see later with one of our partners how interoperability is saving them time and saving them money. When we look at academic certificates, for example, control and access is important. Who has access to your grades? Who has access to your academic certificates? And who is in control of this data? During our journey, we were able to partner with the Dutch Red Cross. And we have a mission now with the Dutch Red Cross, with the Ministry of Defense, to rebuild St. Martin, rebuild the identity part of St. Martin. Natural disasters, they happen on a bi-yearly basis, whether in Africa or in St. Martin. And every time there's a crisis, every time the Dutch Red Cross, they have to put their tent, put their systems, and start registering. The crisis finishes, they take out their tent, they take out their systems, and they go back. And then the crisis happens again, and then again the same process. And here, the efficiency of the system can be improved. Once Ben, the beneficiary, is standing at a Red Cross podium or Red Cross tent asking for help, he can simply take his smartphone or his plastic card that has his picture and his QR code and tap it or share it with the Red Cross employee. The data is saved on the smartphone of the beneficiary. He owns it. And when any organization wants to access this data, they send him a notification. Hello, I am Save the Children. I want to know how many children you have so that we can give you help. He can press, yes, I want to share. No, I don't want to share. 
And in this process, Red Cross will save their time on identifying people, and saving time is saving lives. Which is more important is saving the money. Because now this pot of donations that we have can include more people. So the process starts by me, beneficiary, writing my details out, my first name, my last name, my date of birth, my address, how many kids I have, and a public key is created from this information. This public key can be stored on a network, like blockchain, and can be stored on a central service. The data stays on my phone, using zero-knowledge proofs. Any request that comes, I share only what is necessary. And since it's digital, and since it's working with cryptographic keys, we can offer financial services, like cryptocurrencies. So you, as a donor, you're sitting in this chair, you get a notification, there is a hurricane happening in, Air in uh, St. Martin. Would you like to donate? Would you like to donate five cents? Not any financial network in the world today can send five cents. Crypto scan. 24 hours, Easter is coming. If there is an earthquake somewhere around the world, even in North Korea, we are able to send donations there. On Easter, where banks are not working, and North Korea, where financial systems prohibit us to work with them. But we can still break those two stigmas. All these things that I'm talking about, they happen within an ecosystem. An ecosystem we're designing, and it's called the ANA ecosystem. ANA means me. I have ownership over my data. I have ownership over my money. Self-sovereign identity and self-sovereign money. It's made of different components. The ANA validator, what makes this network sustainable, what drives the business model behind Tycon, is offering the validation process, authentications and verifications at a lower price what it happens today in the market. With this ecosystem, it doesn't work by itself. It needs partners. The Dutch Red Cross is one of our major and strongest partners, partnerships that we have done. They bring 150 years of experience in humanitarian aid, and we are ready and eager to learn from them how to minimize the data that's used, how to identify people and say he is or she is a beneficiary, and so on. We are graduates of the Rockstart Accelerator program. We are one of the Rockstart alumni. And the funny thing is, when we joined uh, Rockstart, we didn't have all this. We were lost, and we were lost because we didn't do our journeys, we didn't do our homework correct. And through their guidance and through their leadership, we are able to stand strong in the identity sector in the Netherlands. And that's why also we work with the Dutch government, Ministry of Justice, I just came from them today, where we agreed to have more educational workshops on what is blockchain and what are cryptos and how can we learn from the identity systems that we are designing. Sovereign is one of the identity blockchains that we are founding stewards at, we have the right to write on that network, and we can help other organizations join Sovereign and benefit from their identity technology. And finally, RSK, which is an Ethereum compatibility written on the Bitcoin blockchain, which will give us Smarter Bitcoin starting May 2018. So we have the partners, we have the ecosystem, but you need a team to drive this technology. And I'm happy to work with the brightest people in the Netherlands. I'll start with Bas. He's a very young 
penetration tester, white hat hacker. He started his first company at the age of 16, and he's leading our development team at Tycon. We don't see him in the office. He's in his development cave with his nice screens. <laughs> Khalid Maliki, he used to work at the Minister of Interior for 10 years as a UX designer. And I would love to add to what Bas was presenting before, that one of the challenges in this technology is the UX and UI. There is absolutely no care of user interfaces and experience when designing applications and when designing infrastructures. And finally, our advisors, which we have only two, so we don't have 10 advisors and two developers, with what you see usually in the blockchain space. Marlou Pomp, she executed more than 35 blockchain pilots with the Dutch government on different uh, levels and on different projects, and they're going now international with a partnership between the Singapore government and the Dutch government. What I want to ask from you guys today is two things, actually. First thing is, I know there is talent in this room. We are at the Eindhoven Tech Campus. I think there is geeks, there is tech people. I can spot some UX designers. So come talk to me later, or just make a uh, screenshot of my details. Send me your CV, send me, your, send me an email, and let's see how can we collaborate together. And why together is important. Because all this market and everything we see today is about hype. Tokens are hype. Cryptos are hype. Blockchain is a hype. But we are proving that it's not a hype. With Tycon, you can bring hope. And it's hope for millions of people. Hope for 1.2 billion undocumented. We're not going to register them tomorrow at once. But we can start, and we can set the trend for people to know how to use this technology and to tell them that we won't wait for a bank with an orange logo and the lion <laughs> to come to Africa and set an office there and include people financially, or for a municipality in the Netherlands to go to Africa and teach the African government how to build civil registries. They will be using something that we together in this room have developed. Thank you. <laughs>